All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3? 2 Timothy chapter 3. I am carrying a seasonal prophetic burden from the, uh, from the Lord right now for the body of Christ concerning the seduction of sin. There's many different words that, that I could use, the deceitfulness of sin, the seduction of sin, the deadliness of sin. And I want to talk about what's happening in our culture today, especially in the church. I want to sound the alarm. I, I love Jesus. I love talking about his ways and his will, but I love exposing the devil. I love alerting believers to his strategies so that we don't fall prey to them. I love seeing believers have consistent, long-term victory over sin and the devil. It's near the heart of God because when we got born again, we have been born again for intimacy, for connection, for nearness, for love for Jesus, and sin is going to try to put a wedge between us and our Creator. And many reasons why people fall prey to sin is because we don't yet recognize just how deadly it is. We don't know its deceitfulness, its cunningness, its seduction, the consequences that come with sin. Quite frankly, I don't believe there's enough messages in the church today about sin. I've been preaching all over the world, the United States, over a decade now. There have been many times I have preached in churches where they have asked me not to use the word sin. Call it a hang-up. Don't preach repentance. Can you just stand people up and prophesy to them? Can you just keep it encouraging? Can you just keep it positive? And all of that to me is an ask from the devil to not expose him. Especially in the prophetic movement and the prophetic community... We love to highlight and emphasize personal prophetic ministry and miracles and talk about dreams and visions at the expense of actually preaching the Word of God. And so I'm going to preach the Word of God to you tonight. I'm going to sound the alarm on the deception and on the seduction of sin in our culture. And then I'm going to look at God's answer, which I realize is Jesus Christ. But there are individuals that God raised up in history that He anointed to confront wickedness and sin like Elijah. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is warning his spiritual son in the Lord Timothy about the last days that we're living in. So 2 Timothy 3, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, hang out with these men. Did I read that right? I'm reading the NSB. It says, and avoid such men as these. Meaning there's a need for consecration. 
there's a need for separation for those of us who are children of the light. When we walk into work, when we're in a setting in the world, there should be something in you called light. His name is Jesus. That should clearly distinguish you from those who are children of the darkness. We have for so long allowed this gray or allowed basically no standard for what it means to be saved and unsaved that many of our messages in the church today we're still trying to figure out who's bearing forth fruit and who's not although they come every Sunday. Paul's warning Timothy, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, avoid those people. Turn over to the book of 1 John. I'm going to begin reading in the second chapter, verse 15, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away in also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have risen. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. If we were to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ in many churches today, we would not fill them up, we would empty them out. And this scripture would be fulfilled. Those who are abiding in the vine, those who are born again are those who love the truth and stay in the light. But those who are hypocrites, those who live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, those who are failing to recognize the deception and seduction of sin, they will leave from that place and it will clearly be revealed who's of God and who's not of God. Elijah was raised up in a time of moral darkness in history. And many of us know the story he has this prophetic gathering, and he says to the people, how long will you waver between two opinions? If John called the meeting, he would say, how long will you act like the world and still call yourself a Christian? There's a line, there's a separation, there's a consecration there's an invitation to an end-time warrior bride. Now is the time to arise and shine, not hide. Now is not the time to be ashamed of who you are in Christ. If ever there was a need for you and I to act saved, like those who are full of the Holy Spirit... 
those who have been given an arsenal to destroy the works of the devil, if ever there was a need to stand out, one man said, you might be the only Bible someone ever reads. So do they know at work you're born again? Do they know at the family reunion that you're a child of the light? Or are we wasting all of our time fitting in and compromise when we were actually born again to stand out and shine? I want to break shame off of some people in this room who are actually ashamed that you're born again, that you're actually living for Jesus, that you're actually making right choices, that you're actually reading your Bible and praying. I want to break off a false sense of shame that the world puts on you. Folks, we need a revival of common sense in the church today. There is so much confusion and so much end time delusion going on out there that people who are living righteously for God have been convinced that they're legalistic. And I saw he put the quote up online, so praise the Lord. But the Lord said to me one day that you will always be called legalistic by people who aren't passionately in love with Jesus. There is a place of encounter and there is a place of intimacy with Jesus where I begin to obey Him out of a love encounter with Him where the grip of the world and sin lose staying power on me. Verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. But you have an anointing. Can I encourage you to own your anointing from the Holy One? What am I anointed for? Holiness. His name is the Holy Spirit. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So Paul the Apostle is admonishing Timothy that great peril is going to mark the last days, and that we should separate ourselves from mixture, that we should not be people of compromise, but that we should be people of covenant. John the Apostle is writing here in chapter 2, and again, he's trying to clearly separate those who love the world and the Antichrist agenda that comes with it versus those who are walking in the light. Have you ever wondered why no letter in the New Testament starts with this? To the sinners at Corinth. To the sinners at Philippi. To this, there's no such thing as a letter written to a church in the New Testament that addresses them as sinners. I want to tell you tonight that once you've been born again, you will never be a successful sinner again. I'm telling you. Satan does not want me to preach this message. Satan does not want his lies that have been swallowed in the church for decades. He does not want me to tell you, you can overcome sin. You do not have to wake up every day fighting pornography. You can have consistent victory... 
not because you're an awesome person, but because the blood of Jesus that was shed at Calvary is stronger than any demonic force. And I, I don't want you to amen me tonight because I need the amen. You need to say amen for yourself. You need to say amen when the word of God is preached because it dismantles lies and demonic ideologies that set themselves up against you and I walking in deep intimacy and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's freedom that comes and flows from Calvary and His resurrection. It says to the saints at Philippi. It says to the saints of the Holy One in Christ Jesus. In other words, when I got born again, God broke the, the grip, the hold that sin and death had on me. And he broke the power of the sin nature off of my life. When I said yes to Jesus, it required I said no to something else. This is why a false gospel that's being preached in America offers you Jesus as an item on a buffet. You can have a little Jesus, a little porn, a little drugs, a little secret sin. You can have a little Jesus and a little of everything else when the truth is Jesus is not a salt and pepper shaker that adds flavor to your life. Why? He is the life. He is the way and He is the truth. Being born again as Jesus plus nothing equals everything. But some of us need to be confronted with a false narrative gospel that accommodates all of our idols and all of our sin. And for so long in the church, we've not wanted anyone to talk about this. It reminds me in Isaiah chapter 30. It's an interesting interaction with the prophet and the people. And this is what they say to Isaiah. Isaiah, stop prophesying to us about the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to hear any more about His holiness. Can you just preach His mercy and grace? So many people have heard messages on the mercy of God and on the grace of God and understand He's forgiven my sins. But that's only half the gospel, folks. I want you to listen to me. His grace and His mercy have extended new life to us and we have been forgiven, but we have been bought with a price. And where we were once slaves to sin, we are now slaves to God. It's more than a forgiveness of sin. We are now His possession. You got transferred, I got transferred from the kingdom of darkness as a slave to now I'm in the kingdom of light and I have a new master. Satan and sin is no longer my master. When I said yes to Jesus, he broke that chokehold where I, I, I tell people, don't get mad at sinners. They're just doing what they do best, sin. They have a sin nature. And they are habitually and continually feeding that nature. But for those of us who have walked into the kingdom of light, He not only broke the power of the sin nature, He's given us a new nature. This is why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, that 
carnal, old nature has been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that live, but he that lives in me. Jesus is not for you and I to fulfill our destiny. He wants us to die and let his destiny arise in us. We've been given a new nature, a new appetite, a new mind, a new heart. What I once crave, I do not crave any longer. Folks, stinking thinking leads to mediocre Christianity. This is why in much of the church, we cannot raise up an army because we're still talking to an audience. We're still talking to people who need to be baby-fed elementary truths of the Word of God because we have allowed thinking that has allowed people to become victims and make insane statements like, I just can't overcome pornography. Do you know that's an assault on the blood of Jesus? Is the blood of Jesus powerful or not? Here's here's the real issue. In Jesus... It's no longer you can't, but you won't. Jesus Christ on the cross has disarmed our excuses. He has confronted our mediocre thinking, and he wants it to replace it with divine thinking. I'm a new creation. The old has passed. The new has come. I thank you, Lord, that the chains and the shackles of my past have been broken. I thank you that you just didn't break me free. You've made me a new person. I'm not that person that I once was any longer. He's freed me from the shame, the guilt, the condemnation. And folks, it only keeps getting better. He not only broke the vice grip off of us as once sinners, now he's called us as saints. He's given us a new nature. And then the next thing he does is he gives us the Holy Spirit. You're not hearing me. You'd be running around the building. If I'm a salesman, I'm giving you the best you've ever heard, and it's free. This is the gospel. He that knew no sin became sin, that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have become the eternal dwelling place of God. Folks, isn't it crazy you and I haven't blown up yet? The God who made the universe has taken up residence on the inside of you. He's our comforter. He's the revealer of truth. He's the teacher. He's the paraclete. He's living on the inside of me and everywhere that I go, He goes too. And I'm not going to drink that, hit that, touch them. Because he's with me. I hope that revealing to you what the gospel has brought to you and I is dismantling our lies and fears. I hope that it's forcing you into a divine wrestle of God, why have I settled? for so far less than what you died for. Lord, when we just say, let the lamb receive the full reward of his suffering, it's more than missions. I want the lamb to receive the full reward in my daily decisions so that I can defeat and conquer sin. 
Romans 6, 12. Let me read you the word of God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. Lord, thank you for true grace that does not leave me in the pig slop, but true grace pulls me up out of it. Lord, I'm, I'm, th- I'm thankful for real believers. Guys, I'm, I'm thankful for real born-again people that are not down with compromise and sin. This has nothing to do with legalism. This has to do with we love Jesus. In Him is light. And there is no darkness. So one man described sin. I can't do a better job, so I'll tell you what he said. He said, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will make you pay a price you don't want to pay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will make you pay a price that you don't want to pay. I'm talking about the culture that we live in today where we're hardly hearing any messages on the deception of sin, the seduction of sin, what the real gospel is really all about, calling people out of compromise and sin and inviting them into a real born-again relationship with Jesus Christ, holding them accountable through discipleship. What is discipleship? Discipleship is surrendering every area of our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's surrendering every area of our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You and I are on a journey surrendering every area of our life underneath His Lordship. I got free from the habitual and the continual sin when I was a sinner... I'm not up here saying you're never going to sin again. But what I am saying is once you truly become born again, you will never be a successful sinner again. I believe that in walking with Jesus, recognizing what He's delivered you from, knowing who you are in Him, renewing your mind, Walking with Holy Spirit, you're going to be on your journey to stand out and let the light shine. But we have to get serious and get sober when we're talking to our kids, when we're talking to our neighbors, when we're talking to our family members. We have to treat sin like the deadly cancer it is. We need to be talking about the consequences of sin. We need to be sharing about the mistakes that we made in sin. We need to be putting the devil on notice that I might feel like I wasted parts of my life in sin, but I'm not going to sit back and be silenced by shame and watch them make the same mistake I did. See, I've come to set some people free. You might be in here like, brother, you don't even know me. I went to prison. I did this. I did that. I thank God for your testimony. Because if you will open up your mouth 
and you will honestly and vulnerably tell your story and tell them how nasty, how disgusting, how seductive sin really is. If you will get courage and expose the devil and stop trying to save your reputation, if you will get bold and courageous, you will see a generation live the life that you could have, but now you'll walk with them into victory. I, I want to hear the stories from the addicts. Tell us all the mistakes and all the sin and all the, so that hopefully a young person sitting there who is being tempted to go down that same path starts hearing the deceptive, seductive nature of sin and says, maybe that's not a good idea. You have something to offer this generation. Whether you were a prodigal or you were a good church boy, elder brother, we all got issues. But we're living in an hour we have to open up our voice, open up our mouth, and we have to expose the lies of the enemy. So in Isaiah chapter 5, he pronounces woes over Israel. It's much like Jesus did in Matthew 23. And in one of his woes, Isaiah says in verse 20, Woe to those who are calling good evil and evil good. Woe to those who are calling good evil and evil good. In chapter 3, just two chapters earlier, Isaiah actually reveals the consequences for that thinking. Folks, there are consequences for sin. How many of you know God forgives us of our sin, but there are still consequences for sin? In a culture that's saying, LGBTQ. I wish I could have put on the, 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 the screen here tonight the picture of a drag queen. And you're like, oh man, the, the woman or the man is probably wreaking havoc in a bar. No, it's the, the principal at John Glenn Elementary School in Oklahoma who they duly elected the principal of an elementary school knowing it's a drag queen who they already have on record has previously child pornography charges. This isn't just some worldly person at a bar. This is a principal at an elementary school. See, I want you to hear my heart tonight. I'm preaching for the children. I'm trying to help you to understand Satan is targeting the next generation. If you've ever been on the streets like me and you hear these people, they'll tell you, we are coming for your kids. This is not a demonic agenda that's trying to hide. It is flamboyant. It, it is reveling. It is enjoying lovers of pleasure. But yet my cry is, where are the lovers of God? How have we let Hollywood get so radical and so in love with the world, yet the church has been neutered by our sin? And we don't want to talk about victory over pornography because we're in bed with it. We don't want to expose Jezebel in America because we're dating her. And we have got to get free from the clutches of sin and death. We have got to let the light of God shine like never before. But it was Isaiah prophetically, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. We're living in a culture 
Again, it's like we need a revival of common sense. You hear people talk, you're like, am I going crazy? I, 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 one plus one is two, and they're saying, no, it's four, brother. You're trying to say, I mean, marriage is between a man and a woman and body parts, and they're like, no, 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 follow the science. And you're like, are you following me? There are things happening in culture today, even in the church. You have Andy Stanley having a conference this weekend, a marriage conference, where he is openly inviting gay ministers to preach from his platform. If it's, if it's not enough that it's bad in culture, you have the pulpit and the church that's become compromised ourselves. I think Jesus was clear. Don't worry about judging people out there. We need to have sober judgment in here. If you, if you claim the name of Jesus, if you are saying, I have said yes to following him, we have to begin to have some meetings and discipleship and some, some, some hard talks about what do I need to do in my life to take a step further into the light like never before. Brother, what, what wrong demonic thinking have I swallowed that has kept me in compromise for decades? So in chapter 3, Isaiah reveals, here's what happens when you live in a culture, in the church and in the world where people call good evil and evil good. Are you ready? God says this, look up in chapter 3, I will give you as judgment. God says, if you do this, this is what I'm going to do. I will give you capricious children as your leaders. He says, I will raise up mere lads and set them over you. Here's what the word capricious means. It means erratic, unstable, given over to mood swings, infantile. In an American culture that's choosing in the church and in the world to call good evil and evil good, what we are receiving of that is childish leadership. Have you ever heard somebody talk and they're just babbling and you have no idea what they're saying? I will give you childish leaders. I will set them over you because of your decisions and your choices. I will raise up church leaders among you who can't even rightly divide the word of God and are just literally spreading mixture and compromise because you have decided to call good things evil and evil things good. When real prophets have stood among you and had been at their post and cried out in repentance, you say to them, sit down and give me a word. Stop preaching repentance. Stop preaching on sin. Can you massage us? Can you just water down church to, to an hour on Sundays? Can we just have a drive through? I mean, I have ADD or whatever. I mean, I, I just I, I need you to get it to me in 15 minutes or less. Not realizing sermonettes produce Christianettes. Not realizing it's amazing the guy in the back who plays video games eight hours a day, can't seem to listen to a 15-minute sermon. The guy in the back who goes crazy about football, who looks like a statue in church. It's called idolatry. Again, it's called, we have allowed for the entertainment of goats in the house of God where we are trying to appeal to unregenerate people who have no desire to come to the kingdom of God. And rather than cater to their flesh, we need bold, courageous men and women who will faithfully preach the word of God, who will invite people into a born-again experience and stop apologizing for it.
We need parents who are going to shut down television. You are not going to watch a movie and a program where there are gay characters. I'm not going to facilitate an anti-Christ agenda in my home and wonder why my kids are having nightmares and or are demonized. <laughs> Folks, this, this is more than pulpit. This is about us taking a stand in our marriage and in our family. And it's going to be tough because we're going to have to take responsibility. I screwed up. Oh, my. I don't know why all these kids need cell phones. I, I have no idea why an 11-year-old, 13-year-old, 8-year-old needs an Instagram account. I don't understand why they need Facebook. I don't understand why they need TikTok. All they're doing is fellowshipping with demons. But brother, they're, they're missing out. On what? Satan and his demons? And who do we think is going to stand before God for that? Oh, but you know, it's like, oh, you know, you, you watch like the parenting thing in this generation, right? It's like therapeutic. We don't discipline anymore. We just, you know, come around a two-year-old throwing a tantrum and, oh, you know, he, and then, you know, they're an angel and they can do no wrong. And, you know, maybe by eight they know what they're doing. Because that's why we don't want to discipline because they, they don't know what they're doing. And it's like you let flesh grow thick for eight years. And a decided, rebellious, you're not going to tell me what to do. And you better believe if you try to engage them at eight, you're in for the war of your life. What's the point? The quicker you can address the flesh. And again, if you've been allowing stuff to go on your home, I'm going to encourage you, man of the home, dad, take responsibility first. Lead the way. This is not about punishing them for their evil deeds. This is about us stepping up as men saying, I'm sorry. Dad made a mistake. Whether it was a lapse in judgment or I just really didn't care or I don't really believe that by watching filth you're not fellowshipping with demons. But we're going to restore order in the home. Folks, for me it's like I can get overwhelmed with culture and I, I need to carry a burden because of my assignment in the body. But ultimately I answer for what happens at home. You get overwhelmed and people they yell about Biden and Trump and the culture and whatever. And it's like, you care more about politics than your own kids. Because you're scrolling on your phone where they're asking you, hey, dad, can you throw the ball? No. Uh -huh. I got to find out what's happening on Fox. I'll give you capricious leaders. I tell you, this is what's happening in culture. Childish, erratic, mood swing, unpredictable, demanding tolerance, but they're the most intolerant people you've ever met. Forget law and order. I'm just going to break into your business. I don't care. I can take what I want. Oh, and by the way, it's in a city who will let me out of jail for doing it lawlessness anti-christ spirit judgment for calling good things evil and evil things good for those that continue to tell me brother sin's really not a big deal you you guys you would not imagine the emails i get we don't need to repent once we're saved you have no idea how much false grace is in the body Stop preaching on sin. We're all the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
Here, here's, here's what I say to people that don't want to hear it. Sin was such a big deal to God that he would rather his son die than sin live. Sin was such a big deal to God that he would rather his son die than sin live. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and cried out, it is finished, there was such an eruption and such a celebration in heaven when he rose and got out of that tomb and he dismantled, he put principalities and powers on notice, he stripped them and died for a whole lovesick family of God to rise above the sin that so easily entangles us and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. There's freedom. There's deliverance. There's wholeness. Turn to 1 Kings 16 and we'll, we'll close here tonight. Again, sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cause you to pay a price you've never wanted to pay. So, 1 Kings 16, verse 29. Are you guys with me? Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So this was a, a bad dude. Underline verse 31. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. Ahab is a king in Israel and scripture describes him as a man who did more evil than any king before him. And it says in verse 31 that he considered walking in sin a trivial thing. This word trivial means not a big deal. I've been trying to talk to us tonight over the last couple of minutes that our approach to sin is everything. We must approach sin and recognize how deadly it really is. How full of deception and destruction sin does not need to be petted or played with or flirted with. Sin must be exposed for what it really is. But Ahab says, sin's not a big deal. Parts of our church culture today, sin's not a big deal. Live how you want. Just repent. Grace, grace. Ah, I think we'll have a bar at the church now. I think we'll just, you know preach false doctrine, we're all going to heaven. We don't want to offend anybody. Don't want to make anybody mad. Jesus never did that. I want you to watch this connection. Sin is not a big deal. Ahab is not rightly understanding the death sentence sin brings. 
What happens next? He marries Jezebel. We have opened up the door to the spirit of Jezebel in uncalculatable ways in the church and in our culture because sin is not a big deal. Jezebel and all her demons, all her sexual demons, all her manipulative, cunning, media demons. We have given her car blanche a free rule and reign, and how did we get there? Sin's not a big deal. When sin is not a big deal, it opens up the door to perversion. Sin's not a big deal, Ahab. What happens? Opens up the door to perversion. Here's what perversion does. Please hear me. Perversion causes us to become attracted to people and things that we were never meant to be attracted to. Oh. It's just a little image on a computer. Not a big deal. God doesn't care. And what you don't realize is you just opened up the door to perversion. And you begin to become attracted to something you were never meant to become attracted to if sin had to become a big deal. Perversion produces unrighteous affections. How many people do you know they married the wrong person? They took the wrong job. They all because we minimized the act of sin and then opened up the door to perversion and I'm now fellowshipping and in relationship with and in bed with someone or something I should have never got here. But I decided to pet, and I decided to flirt, and I decided to ask questions like, how much of the world can I have and still be a Christian? Rather than born-again believers ask, how much of heaven can I still have on earth and breathe? Are you guys tracking with me tonight? Guys, he considered sin a trivial thing. This is why Steve Hill in his day, he really only had one message. Treating sin casually produces casualties. When Brother Hill had an altar call, here was his altar call. Come to meet thy God. He was beckoning a generation out of compromise, out of wickedness, out of hanging out with their sin. He would plead with them. He would cry with them. He would beg with them. And yet decades later, we've normalized evil. We're calling good things evil and evil things good. We're plagued by childish leadership in the church and the world. And God is looking for a people tonight who are going to shut the door on the devil. I'm looking for some fathers tonight to rise up. I'm looking for some real men of God who the test of your faith is not raising your hands at church. It's what you allow at home. I'm looking for some mamas to become mama bears. I'm looking for us to get activated, mobilized. 
I'm like, Lord, you can't mobilize. I love it. But we've got to mobilize an army under the same spirit of conviction. We can't send out an army that's confused about how God feels about sin and its consequences. We can't send out an army to wage war on Jezebel in America if she's among us. Treating sin casually produces unrighteous affections. One more time. When the spirit of perversion is at work in our lives, we become attracted to things and people that we were never meant to become attracted to. Unrighteous affections. Craving things that we should be abhorred by. And they serve Baal. And it just... So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Here comes all the idol worship. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than any king before him. In his days, Hiel the Bethelite built Jericho. He laid its foundation with the loss of Abraham, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. This is a prophecy that Joshua gave that said, the man who builds these gates, it will cost him his firstborn son. What kind of father would do something that would cost him his firstborn son? A man of perversion. What, what kind of father would dabble around in compromise and lust that would end up leaving his kids fatherless in the years ahead? A man of perversion. And in this day and in this hour, where Ahab and Jezebel are ruling the roost, there's perversion. Nobody really cares about sin. There's idol worship. God has an answer. Read verse 1 of 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. If you know the story, Elijah just appears out of nowhere. Elijah the Tishbite, the guy from the wild mountain. And in a nation of compromise and sin, God's answer is to raise up Elijah. And Elijah is going to fulfill his ministry in this day. By drawing a line in the sand and saying, which God are you going to serve? We know that the spirit and power of Elijah is a very real thing. We know that it came in the form of John the Baptist. And we know that the spirit and power of Elijah is going to fall in these days. What I'm here to prophesy to you tonight as we close is simply this. That God is looking for men and women who are going to run with the mantle of Elijah. These are men and women who have a spirit of conviction and covenant resting upon them. These are bold, courageous moms and dads whose hearts are going to turn toward their kids. Are you one of them? I told the Lord, even if you sent me over here for one, I'm good with it. I'm looking for some provokers. I'm looking for some Jesus freaks. I'm looking for some Holy Ghost filled, demon casting out. But 
but we've got to embrace this tension of the seduction of sin. We cannot shrink back when someone's about to make a decision that's going to ruin their life. Here's what I believe real Bible love is. Are you ready? Because isn't that the fight today? Real Bible love cares more about where you're going to spend eternity than offending you right now. Do I love people enough? Do I love the truth enough to step out and faithfully warn people of the consequences of sin? And again, I'm not talking about self-righteously. I'm talking about please share your mistakes. I'm not talking about walking up to someone and just trying to rebuke them for their compromise. I'm talking about start the conversation by sharing a season of your compromise. I want you to engage them and say, Brother, I once had a season in my life where I strayed, where sin no longer became a big deal. And I tried to stay away from people who walked in the fear of the Lord. I was mad at my pastor because he actually preached the Bible, so I didn't go that often. And I know now I see this pattern develop where the more I cared less and less about sin, the more Jezebel and the more perversion begin to fill my life. And I'm just grateful for that one night in Charlotte or grateful for that one night I, I heard the Lord and He called out to me. And He loved me enough to tell me the truth. I, I heard real love. And real love didn't accept my excuses. Real love invited me to repent. And I didn't do some worldly boo-hoo sorry at the altar. Folks, repentance is more than emotionalism. Repentance is throw the stinking TV out your front door. It's going to cost you your kids. That addiction is going to cost you your marriage. Stop. We're not used to people pleading and begging and calling us, please, sir, ma'am. Little thing you don't think is a big deal, it's going to cost your kids in the years ahead. Please consider how you spend your money. Please consider where you take them. Please consider what you introduce them to. Please. And by pleading and by extending the gospel and his mercy, we'll be doing the work of God. There's a sobriety here tonight. There, there's a, a holy convocation. Folks, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. If you don't know, it starts with the, tonight. It's called the Night of Holiness. I'm ready to get marching, but we're here to hear the word of the Lord. What is God saying? Draw near. Leave the compromise. Leave the wickedness. Ask God to renew your mind. It says Jesus was full of joy because he loved grace messages. Oh, whoops. The Bible says, it was a joke, sorry. Jesus was full of the oil of joy. Why? He loved righteousness and he hated wickedness and sin. Jesus had supernatural joy. Do you know that you don't have to be a miserable Christian anymore? Oh man, I'm here on Friday night and I wonder how much... How much fun they're having at the bar. And, you know, I want, uh, man, I'm just missing out at the party. And it's this kind of stinking thinking. 
Folks, days are coming to the church where people out there are going to wonder what they're missing out on in here. Because we're going to get connected to, I was born for eternal glory. I'm not missing out on anything. That's a lie from the pit of hell. What if the sin, what if the choice to sin is not the gaining of pleasure, but the loss of it? you got to get this. What if to sin, where Satan's tempting you, got to have it, you got to have her, you got to have that, you got to have this. What if that's all seduction and lies trying to convince you you're going to gain pleasure by really saying yes to it, you lose true pleasure that's only found in Jesus. Brother, I don't know what you're talking about. Then lay prostrate in the altar tonight and let's cry out to God for a real encounter. Folks, do not settle for praying some little repeat after me and nothing happens. You've got to lay hold of God. You've got to weep over your sin. You've got to go all in. Lord, you can have, in fact, hold on. I'm going to go home and bring all my drugs back to church. I'm going to go home and have a bonfire in the backyard. I'm done with compromise and sin. I I want to invite you tonight. Let's grab hold of God. Some of you tonight, even if I just came for one, Tonight's your night of salvation. Some of us just need to, you know, re-enlist and grab hold and more sanctification. Lord, I want to hate, hate wickedness and love righteousness. And Lord, I'm all in, but I want to go deeper. I hear you tonight. But there could be several people here. I sense that you are. You're here. And you've been going through cycles of addiction. And compromise. The Holy Spirit is here. Reaching out to you. Revealing the love of Jesus to you. Saying it's time to put away the excuses. And just repent of your sin. That's you tonight. I want to tell you. Everything changes. You're going to be crucified with Christ. When you walk out of here, it will no longer be you, but it will be Him that rises within you. You're going to begin a journey of discipleship and surrendering areas of your life, but you will never be a successful sinner again because the chokehold of sin on your life is about to be broken off and you're going to have air for the very first time. And you're going to begin to see in technicolor. The spirit realm is going to be opened up to you. There's a ministry that God has for some people in here that he's going to release. So I want to start there. If if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, and what I mean by that is you're not actively walking with him. If you were to die tonight, you're not really sure where you'd spend eternity. And you hear God calling to you through me, his servant, saying, tonight is your night of salvation. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to make a commitment. If that's you tonight, I want you to stand right where you're at. If there's anyone here tonight. Holy Spirit, we invite you here to do only what you can do. To search the human heart. To reveal truth to us. Lord, we pray every blinder of pride and arrogance be broken off of our lives. Lord, we just say that we need you.
anyone here, God's knocking on the door of your heart. Tonight is your night of salvation. Anyone? I'm going to move to the second group. If you're here tonight, you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, but on this first night of the Feast of Tabernacles, this night of holiness, you know that God is inviting you into a deeper place of intimacy with Him, of connection with Him, of shutting the doors to perversion, of treating sin like how deadly it really is. If you want to walk in a greater measure of sobriety, if you want to restore order to your home as a mom or dad, if you want freedom from pornography, for any of those reasons you feel stirred, I want to invite you down to the altar. I want to invite you to come and just grab hold of God with me tonight and say, Lord, there's got to be more. If that's you, go ahead and just step out of your seat and come down to the front. Lord, we're here to consecrate ourselves. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're inviting us to make a choice tonight. Lord, I pray for conviction in this room over what we're watching, the entertainment that we're allowing in our homes. Lord, all the time that we're wasting on social media, we're being desensitized by evil at an unprecedented rate. God, we ask that you would come tonight and set captives free. Lord, I pray for the fear of the Lord to strike the heart of the church again. Lord, I pray for boldness and courage. Lord, raise up messengers in the spirit and power of Elijah. Lord, raise up your troublers. Lord, raise up men and women who have a backbone, who are willing to set their forehead like flint against the evil in culture. If you have a prayer language, just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. He's in agreement with His Word. His Word has been preached tonight. So let's just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Let's begin to stir ourselves up in our most holy faith. Lord, I pray for fresh baptisms of fire. Holy Spirit, fire to mark this room. Spirit of burning, would you come? Even as the seraphim are burning ones around your throne. Lord, release a spirit of burning in the house tonight. Come on, folks, I need you just for two minutes. Just begin to stand, begin to lift up your voice, and let's begin to collectively begin to mobilize. We're mobilizing in the Spirit under a yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's it. Begin to pray. More, Lord. More, Lord. Increase your presence. God, bring your glory back to the church again. Attention all revivalists and passionate believers. We're excited to announce Encounter Coffee has a new blend called the Wigglesworth Blend. The Wigglesworth Blend is a new, unique blend bold roast of coffee designed to awaken you and your faith in the mornings. And with every single bag of coffee we send, you are helping us to set slaves free from human trafficking. With each cup of coffee, you are contributing 
to help us liberate children from the blight of human trafficking. Right now, for a gift of any size, you can get your very first bag of the Wigglesworth Blend if you go to EncounterToday.com and click on the special offer. If you would like more bags of coffee, you can go to the Encounter store and get as many as you like. But let's set slaves free together. Let's advance the gospel together with Encounter Coffee.